Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. On September 14th, 1767, a massive crowd gathered around the road to Tyburn, thronging around the hangman's cart, throwing vegetable peels and other refuse. They shouted profanity at the occupants of the cart, one of, who, one of whom was Elizabeth Brownrigg, the most controversial criminal to grace the pages of the London papers. The jeering crowd followed the cart three miles to the public gallows, where they continued to hurl abuse at the condemned. They watched, ghoulishly pleased, as she ascended the steps up to the scaffold to be unceremoniously hanged. Her remains were then publicly dissected and exhibited for all to see. This humiliation was the final phase of her punishment. Dun, dun. I gave you the dramatic reading part. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Most societies are fascinated by women murderers. We see it now with hit movies about serial killer Eileen Warnos, um, mega publicized trials like those of Casey Anthony and Jody Arias, and in the natural world, where a cult of admirers has grown around the Black Widow spider and other species who are known to regularly kill their mates or their young. Yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. This, I thought you were one of them. Yeah, we thought you were a Black Widow spider Because aren't you raising up all those children to eat them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really confused mm. about that. Um, this trope of the murderous wife and mother can be found throughout most of recorded history. But in 1767 London, it blew up in a big way. A community midwife and mother of 16 was charged with the torture and murder of the young apprentice girls she had been fostering from her local parish. Stories of her depravity, depravity, why did I say it that way? It's weird. Stories of her depravity were devoured, what, depravity? (laughs) Why can't I say it? I know how to say depravity. Okay, hang on. (laughs) Whatever. Stories of her depravity were devoured hungrily by Londoners of every station. No one seemed to be able to reconcile her public image of a devoted spouse, midwife, and mother, and law-abiding woman with her alleged systematic torture and murder of helpless young girls. Today, we're talking about the notorious child abuser, murderer, and executed criminal Elizabeth Brownrigg. I'm Marissa. And I'm Avril. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. Hey, loyal listeners, we got a really special email from a longtime listener. We want to share it with you. If you send us an email or an I- or leave us an iTunes, re- iTunes review, you could be featured on a future episode, too. So go out and do that now. This one is from W.J. Brand. And thank you, W.J. Brand, because this warmed all of our hearts. Hey, ladies. As always, I love the most recent episode, Charles Dickens and Scary Winter Stories. I'm English. and could re- Oh, should I do an English accent? No, I shouldn't. That'd be bad. <laughs> and could relate so much to what a, to a lot of what you said. However, the scary story side I never really processed. I think partially because British Christmas culture is now so heavily influenced by American Christmas culture. I thought I'd share a few things that relate to your podcast and a few things that are perhaps modern traditions that weren't. The Christmas pudding, I personally am not a fan of. However, my grandma makes one for, a, for all of her kids every year and makes them really early. Apparently, the earlier you make them, the better. I'm talking months before Christmas. Mm -hmm. My dad watches Doctor Who religiously and always makes me, made me watch the creepier stuff. But he enjoys the scary movies, etc. So that's probably why I never saw it as a tradition. You mentioned that us Brits are better with emotions around the holidays. And I think one Christmas song shows that a lot. Although it's written by an Irish band and based uh, in, in in New York City. The Pogues. Uh, Fairy Tale of New York which leads on to a a fairly modern British and perhaps Irish and maybe even American, I couldn't say, tradition of on Christmas Eve being in the pub with friends celebrating Christmas, normally until midnight. 
A part of this, which has become very common, is going for a curry beforehand. The atmosphere in the pub is of a celebratory nature, but also, as you mention in your podcast, has a feeling of reminiscence. People might toast friends or loved ones, settle a long-standing argument or feud, mostly in reconciliation. I have seen many a pub fight on Christmas Eve, unfortunately. So it, the line in the Pogue song, I could have been someone, well, so could anyone, really rings true to a normal Christmas Eve night. I can't say I've ever heard a scary story at the pub on Christmas Eve, but it's not to say it doesn't happen. Many, many thanks for your podcast, ladies. I look forward to it every week, and the way you conduct your podcast continues to inspire me in studying history. I wish you a happy holiday and Merry Christmas, Billy. Thanks, Billy. We appreciate you. Thanks for listening. Um, and be sure, other listeners, to leave us a review or send us an email. Thanks, Billy! We love you, and on with the show. London's most notorious woman murderer was born Elizabeth Cole in 1720 to a respectable but working-class family. As was the case for the majority of working-class women in the 18th century, Elizabeth spent most of her 20s working as a servant for a family in Prescott Street. Goodman's Fields, London. Right. So it does a street and then the neighborhood and then the city. Okay. You don't have to do it that way. But I that's did just it. how everywhere you read it, that's they're like, oh, it's Prescott Street because it still exists. So you could just go there. Prescott Street, Goodman's Fields, London. At the age of 27, she married a house painter, James Brownrigg. This might surprise people. Most non-historians think that people married quite young in centuries past. But at this point, the British economy could not support young marriage. This was the same in France and the Netherlands. Historians call this the Western European marriage pattern. This was a time when couples postponed marriage until their late 20s, working for wages instead of the f instead for the first decade or so of their adult lives. So Elizabeth, Elizabeth Brownrigg's life up to this point was quite typical for her generation. During the early years of their marriage, Elizabeth ran a boarding school in Greenwich, London. She was generally considered a decent human being, but neighbors sometimes criticized her for being domineering with servants and domineering over her spouse. And he was what contemporaries called a, quote, hen-pecked husband. Hmm. You know. Like Pat. I roll. <laughs> 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 um, so... This could have very well been true, and as you'll see with her personality, it probably was true, but um, this was a way of describing married women, um, and this was really common in the 18th century. In my own research on poor women, I see they were often called viragos or shrews. This basically meant that they were violent or domineering or bad-tempered, so not womanly, I guess. And I find that most women were either characterized this way or as meek and mousy and, you know mild domicile right um it's kind of like today we have these stereotypes for women depending on their occupation or personality you're either a or a slut bleep <laughs> um, in the 18th century you were either meek and compliant or a raging virago um and there wasn't often a competent respected mean between these two extremes at least not in popular culture together elizabeth and james produced no less than 16 children some accounts put that number as high as 19. Uh, I don't even know if that's even mathematically possible, considering she didn't meet James until 1747 and was dead 20 years later, unless she had some multiples, couple sets. Right. Mm -hmm. Or was literally pregnant every nine months. Ugh. For 20 years. How henpecked was her husband if he's forcing his, yeah. his body on her body every nine months? I know. Gross. <gasps> Only three of these children, though, reached adulthood. It's true that infant mortality was pretty high at this time. About 16% of babies born alive at this time were expected to die before their first birthdays. As many as half of all children were expected to die before the age of 12 due to childhood diseases like mumps, measles, etc. So, vaccinate your children. <laughs> but even so, three surviving children out of 16 to 19 is very low. And the fact that none of the female children survived is even more strange. After the extent of her crimes was uncovered, Londoners theorized that she might have beaten some of her own female infants to death or murdered them outright. Well, we'll never know, but it is a possibility. Always nice to contemplate some infanticide. Yeah, it's a good time. 
1765, the Brown Rig family moved to Fleur de Luce Court. And sometimes it'll be, it'll say Flower de Luce because Fleur the Brits flower. have to anglicize everything and mm-hmm. nothing can be French ish. So, they're correct about that. The <laughs> they are correct. Yeah. Fleur de Luce Court, um, Fetter Lane, London. Um, so, this is this is their family home and this is where all the, the shit goes. Wait, down. I have a question. What? Is that what L I E U means for lieutenant? It means left. Lieutenant. Left Does Lou mean left? How do you say left in French? Gauche. Oh, so why isn't it gauche? I've always tenant? wondered why it was lieutenant too, but no. Um, they just I don't know because they needed it to weird. not sound French. Basically. Right. It's true. They just they just it's just anglicizing of it. They didn't they don't replace the French word with the English word always. Sometimes they just refuse to pronounce it how French people would. Right. You know? Yeah, it's ridiculous. So anyway, Fleur de Luce, Flower de Luce, whatever. Uh, James continued painting, and Elizabeth started acting as a sort of unofficial midwife. Um, The overseers of the poor of St. Dunstan's Parish, which is where the parish where they lived, charged her with the care of pregnant women from the workhouse. So she wasn't, like, trained or anything. She didn't, she wasn't, she wasn't apprenticed to a midwife. Mm -hmm. She didn't have any medical training or, or any even just common training they were just like hey we need someone to take care of these pregnant women and she was there when they gave birth usually so they just called her a midwife call the midwife right she was said to have quote displayed great skill in humanity and quote when tending to her clients she was also described at this time as a faithful wife and affectionate parent by her neighbors to help them with the unofficial midwifery business, the brown rigs were given several young girls as apprentices. Apprenticeship in the 18th century was a combination of boarding school, foster care, and child labor. Poor children as young as preschool age, although usually older, were bound out to a laborer or tradesman. They'd do odd jobs for their master in exchange for room, board, and usually some education. Some apprentices were taught basic math or how to read. After a, set of, after a set amount of time, often as much as 11 years, the apprentice would be released out into the world. Sometimes they became journeymen or servants, performing the trade they'd learned as an apprentice. Other times they became one of London's many indigent poor. Sometimes their master was the only parent figure they'd ever known, but he was also their boss and sometimes even their instructor. It's kind of sad in some ways, but also a somewhat necessary way to form poor and abandoned children into independent members of society. Right, so for the time it kind of made sense. Uh, anyway, the Brown Rig's first apprentice was a 14-year-old named Mary Jones. Apparently, Elizabeth, her husband James, and their eldest son John took to beating and abusing Mary Jones. After, and I'm saying her full name, you'll see why. It's because these are all Marys. There are a lot of Marys. Yeah. Catholic. <laughs> After enduring this abuse for a few months, Jones escaped to the Foundling Hospital with tales of imprisonment, drowning, and countless beatings. The overseers of the poor were horrified by her condition. She was covered in a series of nasty wounds. And she was also very thin and underfed. Um, the overseers dissolved the apprenticeship, ending Jones's time in the Brown Rig household. But they left Mary Mitchell, which is their other uh, apprentice, in their service and continued to send apprentices to the Brown Rig home. Hmm. <laughs> Good job, overseers. London was flooded with abandoned children. From 1756 to 1760, the London Foundling Hospital opened its doors to all and hosted what's known as the General Reception. In years past, it had been difficult to petition for a spot in the Foundling Hospital. But those admission rules were temporarily suspended, and all poor infants were accepted. During this time, 15,000 infants were accepted into the hospital. That's about 10% of all London births during this time. Mary Jones was one of these babies. The massive influx of poor babies into the hospital was such a strain on London's poor relief system that the hospital had to tighten up its admissions criteria again around 1760. So this is the state of social services in London at this time. Parish workhouses and private relief organizations were strained to the max. This is probably one reason why 
The overseers of St. Dunstan continued to send apprentices to the Brown Rigs after Jones' escape. They had few choices and probably convinced themselves that Jones just so happened to have a contentious relationship with the Brown Rigs. Right, they're probably just thinking, well, this one didn't work out. Let's yeah. keep it going. So Mary Jones's replacement, Mary Clifford, was sent to the house in February 1766. And yes, they're all named Mary, every single one of the apprentices. Um, Clifford and Mitchell, that's the one who'd been there for the long haul, were also tortured by Elizabeth, her husband, and son. Mitchell tried to escape once, taking a play out of Mary Jones's book, but her plan was foiled by one of the Brownrigg sons who apprehended her on the street. Together, the girls were stripped naked, strangled with chains, and hung up by hooks in the kitchen and cellar. Elizabeth Brownrigg's midwifery business grew. She delivered poor women at her own home as well as at a house she rented in Hampstead. Keep in mind, these are poor indigent women. So even though most babies were born at home at this time, these women were usually homeless and kind of in and out of the workhouse. So they had to give birth either at the workhouse or at the midwife's home. So she was actually housing some of these women, too. Mm. She would have had a lot of lodgers. While Brownrigg's reputation as a midwife grew, Clifford and Mitchell lived in misery. Some sources say they lived in a freezing coal hole, while more dramatic accounts say they lived in a muddy sty under the stairs where the hogs lived. They were given one piece of bread per day and no water. They got their drinking water from the hogs' trough. They were often bound and beaten severely with whips and straps, quickly dressed again in their dirty clothes, and beaten again before their previous wounds had healed. They never slept in a bed, even once, during their time in the brown rag home. When Elizabeth Brown Rigg went into the country on the weekends, they were chained under the stairs. They especially dreaded those times. After the ordeal, Mary Mitchell recounted some sad stories. There's one about Mary Clifford being so starving that she broke open a locked kitchen cupboard but got no reward for her risk because it was empty. Her punishment was particularly severe. The Brown Rigg stripped her naked and strangled her over and over until just before the point of death. At the end of the night, they threw her in the coal shaft with the chain still around her neck. The Marys were often asked to do things that they were physically incapable of doing, such as erect a bedstead. So some a big, giant, heavy 18th century bedstead. It would have been something that you would have needed several adult men to do. Um, or they would ask her to carry heavy objects around, um, knowing she couldn't. Uh, when they inevitably failed, especially considering they were starving, injured, and suffering from exposure because their their sleeping arrangements weren't heated or anything, um, this was an excuse for Elizabeth Brownrigg to execute another vicious beating. Clifford once disclosed the abuse to an elderly French lodger staying in the Brownrigg home. The lodger confronted Elizabeth Brownrigg, who, in a rage, retaliated by cutting Mary Clifford's tongue with scissors. Ugh. I know. That's horrible. Yes. One summer day, the Brown Rigs' abuses were uncovered, and as one contemporary said, quote, the, human, the inhuman tigress was cut off in the middle of her barbarous career. On the 31st of July, Clifford was stripped and beaten with a whalebone whip. After the beating, she was left naked and bleeding in the cellar. She went in and out of consciousness for four days, and on August 4th, a suspicious neighbor saw her through the Brown Rig skylight barely alive and semi-conscious on the cellar floor. No one had cleaned or dressed her wounds, but Brown Rank had poured cold water over her a few times. So thoughtful. Yeah, really <laughs> nice of her. Um, the girl's mother came to visit a few days before this, asking after her daughter. In most cases, poor children kept in contact with their parents during their apprenticeships. They visited on their afternoons off or on holidays. Brown Rank told her that her daughter was out in the country. The girl's mother was unconvinced, but there wasn't much she could do. She was even more alarmed when the neighbor saw her leaving the property and took her aside. Mr. and Mrs. Deacon, these are the neighbors um, who live next door, told the girl's mother about their suspicions about her mistreatment. This interaction with the girl's mother put the Brown Rigg's neighbor on high alert. So it, was only, so it was only a matter of days before Mary Clifford's broken body was seen on the property. The snooping neighbor, almost certainly Mr. Deacon, notified the girl's mother, who notified a parish officer. A small party of well-respected men accompanied him to the Brownrigg house. They asked to see Mary. 
The Brown Rigs played up the whole Mary Mary thing by producing Mary Mitchell, who was horribly thin and frail, but not horribly beaten. After hours of threats and game playing, the Brown Rigs finally produced Mary Clifford, who was near death. Her head was swollen to several times its normal size, and there was barely any spot on her body that was not bleeding or turning black from infection. She was really, like, I mean, literally almost dead. Yeah. Not just beaten really bad. Um, Mary Clifford was carried to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, where the surgeons discovered there was little they could do to help her. The surgeon, quote, declared that the wounds she had received by whipping were so bad for want of dressing that her shift had eaten into them, and they appeared as if cut with a knife, that scarce a part of her body was free, and that her head and face were much wounded, end quote. She was unable to speak, her neck and throat being almost destroyed. So she had so many cuts and mm. contusions that she, like, literally couldn't talk. And also the stranglings. Right, and being in and out of consciousness yeah. and all kinds of things. Um, in the confusion of the immediate aftermath, which revolved around the girl's well-being, Elizabeth Brownrigg escaped apprehension. Initially, her husband was arrested because he was the most likely suspect. So as soon as they found Mary Clifford near death, they were like, oh, obviously, let's arrest the husband. Um, but after interviewing their other apprentice, Mary Mitchell, it was clear that Elizabeth Brownrigg was the primary abuser. But she was nowhere to be found. For this reason, her crimes and character were circulated far and wide early on in pamphlets, posters, newspapers, and by word of mouth. So this is kind of one of the reasons that it became... A huge a thing yeah. because they're looking for her she's mm -hmm. at large mm -hmm. an investigation ensued over the next few days the brown rigs male apprentices interviewed and said that they were treated fine but they knew about the mistreatment of the girls this is one of the reasons why neighbors speculated that she'd murdered her girl children it seemed too much of a coincidence that her abuse was aimed only at her girl servants and not the boys and that out of her 16 children only three all of them boys survived Unfortunately, the conditions of the male apprentices' indentures prevented them from incriminating their master, so the investigation continued. Meanwhile, Brown Rink had met up with her eldest son, 19-year-old John. The pair were living in a rented room above a, above a Chandler's shop, pretending to be husband and wife. <laughs> like, how far do they take this pretend? Yeah, it's really gross. Ugh. Just like, I don't, they probably were just like pretending in public but it's still like what if they were the everything kept saying they slept in the same bed but that's not that crazy people, people all slept, slept, slept in the same bed, bed. yeah <laughs> but still they probably were really pretending. they were probably boning they were definitely much. boning <laughs> i hate them i hate the brown rings it's weird that they were pretending to be husband and wife but they were probably able probably able to get away with this kind of thing a lot more in the 1700s because most people entered into several marriages over their lifetime um, although not usually with their sons. <laughs> not usually, no. <laughs> no, not usually. Uh, death rates were so much higher that widows and widowers were more numerous than they were they are today, and so were subsequent marriages and blended families. So it wouldn't have been the craziest thing in the world for a young man to have married an older woman unless she was his mother. <laughs> then that would be weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um that Sunday, Mary Clifford succumbed to her injuries, and after the coroner's inquest, Mr. and Mrs. Brownrigg and their eldest son, John, were charged with willful murder. It's just, like, as opposed to accidental murder. Mad I don't slaughter. know. Yeah, I know, but just willful murder is just, it's just like, duh, murder, yeah, whatever. Murder. Just, Okay. So after hearing the news of Mary Clifford's death, Mr. Brownrigg, in jail since she'd been discovered, wept bitterly, saying that he knew his wife mistreated the girls, but that he was not guilty of murder and would not have been able to contradict anything she did, you know, because she was such a raging shrew. Um, the investigation turned up evidence that he'd also whipped the girls regularly and that one time he even broke his whip and then mended it. Before finishing the beating, all in one evening. So he's so, full of shit. Yeah, so he's full of it. Um, thanks to the immense publicity the affair received, they were apprehended quickly. The Chandler read about the brown rigs in the Daily Advertiser and realized that his lodgers fit their description perfectly. Except for the part where they were boning. Yes. Ugh. Ugh. Each Ugh. other. As Gross. mother and son. <laughs> Um, he notified the authorities, who quickly descended on the Chandler shop and found the two in their rented room. Mrs. Brownrigg was relaxing on the bed, and her son was pacing worriedly across the room. After they just boned. Oh, <laughs> okay, let's give it up. All right. With them, authorities found several disguises. Several sources say that she even dressed as a man. 
No. The horror. That was <laughs> evidence enough to hang her. <laughs> Accused criminals customarily had a public interrogation with the Lord Mayor. While the brown rags waited for this, Elizabeth started to suffer from quote unquote violent fits. Uh, or apparently seizures, maybe? Or she faked it. So the interrogation with the Lord Mayor kept being postponed due to these episodes. But every day, a larger and larger mob gathered outside the jail, anxious to see Brownrig pay for her crimes. The mob was rowdy enough that the Lord Mayor opted to dispense with the interrogation of Elizabeth Brownrig entirely. He feared that the angry mob would overrun the court and kill her. James Brownrigg's public interrogation went ahead, so more details of the family's crimes became public. The mob, again, you know, grew even angrier, because they should. One account reads, quote, The people expressed their abhorrence of her crime in terms which, though not proper for the occasion, testified their astonishment that such a wretch could have existed. They even prayed for her damnation instead of her salvation. They doubted not but that the devil would fetch her and hoped that she would go to hell. Such were the sentiments of this mob. I think, like, those are all things we just say to normal, to people yeah. all the time, like, you know, to my husband, go to hell, or whatever. But to them, that was like, <gasps> just think of the horrible things. They told her to go to hell. She doesn't deserve salvation. It's just so funny how much things have changed. Um... So, on September 4th, the brown rigs were, secu- er, were secretly moved from the local jail to Newgate, which is the London prison where criminals awaiting their trials at the Old Bailey stay. Um, they were somehow removed safely. The brown rigs' trials were held on September 12th. James and John brown rig were acquitted of murder. And Elizabeth brown rig, her trial was about nine hours long, was, to the satisfaction of an angry mob, found guilty of murder and sentenced to hanging and public dissection. Of course, the standards of trial evidence were not as strict as they are today. Most of the evidence against Elizabeth brown rig was, by today's standards, circumstantial. But to them, it was clear. It appeared that someone had been living in the hogs- hogsty under the stairs. The authorities had seized several implements of torture. They found hooks and staples on the walls of the cellar, which were consistent with the girls' stories of being strung up and beaten. All of these things were damning, but the hardest evidence against her was the word of her family. Brownrigg had such a large family, which included many servants, and they were all eyewitnesses to her cruelty. They all seemed relieved to be able to tell their stories, and the consistency of their stories did her in. Two days later, Elizabeth Brownrigg was hanged at Tyburn. The Newgate calendar recorded the last moments she spent with her family, and it's it's kind of sad, so I'm going to, I'll read it. Um, it says, quote, the son falling on his knees, she bent herself to him and embraced him. The husband was kneeling on the other side. She also kneeled down and having besought the Almighty to have mercy on her soul, said, dear James, I beg that God for Christ's sake will be reconciled and that he will not leave me nor forsake me in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, end quote. It's so like weird, I guess, to think that a person could be so cruel and so heartless and be basically a murderer, but then, like, also really loved by her family. Wait, did they love her? Yeah. They were sobbing, and they couldn't even stand up when they saw her to say goodbye. Hmm. And they all hugged, and she was just like, oh, I really hope I don't go to hell. <laughs> but if I do, so, I'll see you there, you f-ers. Right. <laughs> That's probably what she was thinking, yeah. Mm-hmm. After the execution, her body was taken down from the scaffold and delivered to the Old Bailey, where it was dissected and anatomized in public. Her skeleton was then exhibited in the surgeon's hall in the Old Bailey as a deterrent to other violent crimes. This ritualistic, gruesome sort of punishment was meant to humiliate the deceased and their families. But we want to point out here is that There is something about this that doesn't make sense. Londoners were horrified and angry about Brownrigg's crimes, but they were also sort of titillated. And this is the part they didn't realize at the time. In our episode on the Marquis de Sade, we discussed the connections between violence and sexual desire. We can see a little bit of that that here. 
The stories of bondage, beatings, and imprisonment within the Brown Rig home were repeated and, and dramatized for decades to come for many reasons. But one reason was that it was strangely erotic and exciting. It's ironic because the same Londoners who were horrified by her crimes were the same ones who watched with excitement and captivation as her new dead corpse was chopped up in public. Right. <laughs> And they're like, yeah, you're getting what you deserve, but it's just, you know. And we're going to watch. Yeah. I guess it's an idea. I guess it's like Boobies. the idea of revenge or whatever. Yeah. But um, her story was also trivialized somewhat by English parents who were trying to get their naughty children to behave. One 1835 author called Elizabeth Brownrigg, quote, that bugbear of our childhood. So we know that Victorian parents threaten their children with something like, if you keep misbehaving, I'll send you over to Elizabeth Brownrigg's house or Hmm. Or something like that. Terrifying. Um, right. And so my mom, um, I have a funny story, used to threaten to send me to Singapore to get caned when I was really bad. Is it because, because you, were, you were chewing she's gum? She's super not PC. But because there was really like... Weird. do you, No, because there was like um, some special on Dateline or something about an American who was in Singapore for some reason for like a study abroad or something. Mm -hmm. And he did something wrong, like, I don't know, smoked weed or something like that. And they he was caned publicly. No, but you get so, caned for chewing gum. In Singapore. That's, okay. That's well, lot. maybe he was chewing gum. I don't know. But he was. was caned. And so my mom would always say, do you want me to send you to Singapore? <laughs> like, whenever I was bad. Because um, I watched something. punishment. I know. But then she also used to threaten to send me to Amish camp, which does not exist. But she knew that I would really hate it. Because we'd go to look at Amish quilts and stuff. And I'd be like, ugh. Like, they're all gross. And they don't have electricity and whatever. And my mom would say, well, I'm going to send you to Amish camp, like, that I would have to spend the whole summer. Meanwhile, that's, like, what Sarah's mom promised to give like, her Like, right, Christmas. she was like, she I'll like... send you guys to Amish camp. And Sarah was like, yes! yes! We're going to make our own clothes and ride horses and, <laughs> and churn butter together. It's going to be great. It actually sounds really relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little pioneer farm, and we'd go and we'd have to undress and put on, like, pioneer clothes. Yeah, sorry, I should have. <laughs> Like, no, 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 that like, sounds so awful. In the same room, and all we together. Made, like corn husk dolls, and yeah, we churned butter, and that made awesome. candles, and the actually, horses and milked cows. Well, well Niagara Heritage yeah. Village has something very similar that I've, probably like I've that. thought about sending Ainsley to. Well, you me should. And my sister both went to it, and we loved it. So you should send yes. your, your children. <laughs> All right. Well, as a 12-year-old or whatever, that sounded horrible to me. But mostly, my mom's a germaphobe, so whenever we went there, she was like, they don't wash their hands, they don't, they use an outhouse, they don't have running water, they don't, like, he, she, like, had all these lists of things that were disgusting about it. God. She didn't, like, make it seem awesome like you just did. No. <laughs> <laughs> Londoner's fascination with brown rig continued in print for almost a century. The terrible nature of Brown Rigg's crimes provoked various reactions from jests to near pornographic to the sober social analysis found in Gentleman's Magazine, which questioned how children could suffer in such a metropolis as London. Two years after the affair, a historian of London wrote that the story cannot, quote, cannot fail to fill every lover of humanity with surprise. That's how they spell surprise. No, oh, that's wrong. I know. With surprise and sorrow that there should exist among the human species a wretch who, instead of acting the part of mother to these destitute children, could, with a heart steeled against every tender and humane sentiment, rack her inventions for means to torture and torment them. Is it not too much... Is it not too amazing that such a horrid scene of inhumanity could be so long and so secretly perpetrated in the very heart of the city and in a public and creditable neighborhood like whoa god forbid oh. um but any true crime buffs out there like myself will love this quote because it's exactly the same thing that people say today mm -hmm. so most stories of current crimes they're framed by how unreal it is that this is a family man or a loving mother or a church deacon or whatever who could commit such a violent crime and that such a crime could happen in a sleepy town or a picture-perfect suburb or a small rural hamlet and so on. It's like, that's how everything is always framed. Like, no one would suspect. Do we still call them hamlets? I don't know. I call oh, okay. them hamlets. That's cute. Okay. Um, so I them okay, there you go. Adorable. So this was, of course, um, the largest metropolis in Europe. But still, people could not believe that an ordinary woman living in an ordinary London neighborhood could commit such atrocities and that it would just be allowed to happen. Yeah. Like, who let this happen? Yeah. 
There was also, actually, some of the people that wrote about it wrote, well, thank God, now the overseers of the poor have, you know, mended their ways, and now they're a lot more careful about, it's sort of at the end of every true crime television episode, it's like, well, you know, she was murdered and raped and whatever, but now we have this law that came about that's named Mm. after, like that, you know, you're always looking for some positive change because of this horrible thing that happened. It's the same thing in the 1700s. Every crime that people wrote about, they were like, oh, well, at least now we can... We can move on with our lives in a positive direction. Right. Because humans need that. We do. Similar themes were raised in several contemporary pamphlets, including An Appeal to Humanity, 1767, as well as in later publications such as The Cries of the Afflicted, published in 1795, Brown Rig the Second, or A Cruel Stepmother, published. That's very obviously nineteenth century, eighteen twelve. Yeah, <laughs> stepmothers. Because they're trying. They get really. They romanticize things at that point. And the atrocious life and horrid cruelties of Elizabeth Brown Rig, published in eighteen thirty, which reveal her enduring infamy in the popular imagination. People find it really difficult to understand how someone that is like them, someone they identify with could commit violent and sadistic crimes. And Marissa thinks that this is why (laughs) true crime media is so popular. I think it is. Well, it depends. Some people really like serial killer stuff or cult stuff because it's weird and they can't imagine, oh, like, I can't imagine committing mass suicide for some guy because he told me to. You know, so some people like that, I, myself... And more into, like, random murders where, like, it's just normal people, like, a couple, and then, you know, something happens and, like, the woman flies off the handle and murders her husband. Or, you know, um... Because that's what she dreams of doing. No! I pause and say that you just said, I'm more into random murders. Yeah, (laughs) I'm more... I am... Like, because... Because that's what is so fascinating about true crime to me, is that it's just a normal person living their normal life, um, and, you know going about running errands, going to work, going to school, whatever, and plotting to murder their husband. Or vice versa. You know, like a husband who's like, yeah, let's take out some big life insurance policies. They, these people sleep in the same bed together. They're married, had a wedding, just like... But they probably haven't had, haven't had sex in a few months. Maybe. Who knows? Maybe. It's reason to kill someone. True. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It is. But, you know, it's just strange to think that these people, like, living in close quarters or whatever, that one of them could be actually plotting to and the life of the other. Yes. Um, and the same thing with child murderers. I mean, it's, there's some, most children are killed by their own parents. Mm. Um, children who are murdered. And John Benet Ramsey. Everybody knows it's true. If she was killed by her brother, okay. Her brother? I yeah. think it was her parents. Oh, no, her brother. Have you seen that show on Netflix? Just saying. No, no but she was killed it's by her brother. fascinating. It's so, is it, it was about, really fascinating. Is it about Jean, Jean Benet? called Casting. Yeah, Casting, casting Jean, Jean Benet. Benet. Yeah. And it's about... They, they make it seem as though they're going to... Well, they're making this show, make, Casting Jean Benet, and it's all the casting videos where they interview the people who lived in the community for the po- various parts of the mom and the dad. And, and uh-huh. they do, with using different these different actors, they play out each of the different scenarios that people have suggested are the actual right. story of what happened to Jean yeah. Benet. And it's, you really are like, oh, wow, that it definitely was the mom. And then they do it again, and you're like, oh my god, no, it was definitely the brother. And I, I have no idea, like, I don't feel strongly about any of them, because they all seem really, like, yeah. they could Plausible. have been. Was the brother when it happened? I can't like remember. nine or yeah, something. Yeah, wasn't real He was, ugh, so awful. But he, I think it was him, and I think it was just an accident. And I think that the parents were like, shit, what do we do now, like, if we just go yeah. to, like, I think it, if it was an accident... It was way more likely to be the brother than one of the parents accidentally killing their kid. Don't you think? I don't know. Yeah, but the, it's, in we're, this we're, they we're, talk about the mom like flying off the handle about something and getting really, really angry. And, and it, I think all of all of them had a degree of realism to them. Right. Yeah. No. I, yeah. But that's that's the thing is that right. they were just like normal, super mega rich, but normal ish people. Right. And this happens, and there's, you know, there's only three options or so. I mean, I guess there's four options. Four. So, somebody who came in and right. killed. But, but, like, the three most likely options are that one of her family members murdered her. Mm-hmm. And that's just, like, it's just so outside of the realm of possibility in my brain. Mm-hmm. That it's just, that's why I love stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen that yet. It's good. There's this thing about 
like, oh, she's a woman, she's a mother, she's supposed to be, you know, she's a midwife, she's supposed to be laying gentle hands on these, like, children or whatever. But no, she got some sort of, like, sick pleasure out of torturing these children. This wasn't just beating, like, hey, you didn't do your job right, I'm gonna beat you. That was probably normal, actually. This is more, you know, hey, let's see how far we can take this um, torture sort of thing. Mm-hmm. She liked to sometimes um, near drown them. So that's one of the things that Mary Jones, who first escaped, had argued that, or had said that she kept trying to drown her. She would put her, her head in a pail until she was, like, almost dead. dead, And then pull her out, let her catch her breath for a while, do it again. Her. Yeah. Have, there's something, I think, sort of, there's something um, about this story that sort of... Um, transcends time in that we continually have stories of of horrible mothers mothers who like subvert their role right mothers are like you said mothers Mm -hmm. are supposed to be nurturing and loving especially to their own children but to children in general like that's what we expect of women because i'm thinking of like in the 1990s those books that were super super popular at least where i was a a child called it Mm mm-hmm um, yeah, that was. I haven't read it, but it, I know it's about. It was child this. Abuse. Yeah, yeah, it was a, a absolutely horrific story of this little boy who was just horribly, horribly abused by his mother. Yeah, and like the other children in his family were all treated normally. It was just him. Like he was the center of all of the abuse. And so, the one I think one of the reasons that that story it also had like very Christian overtones and stuff. But um, one of the reasons that story was so that book was so popular is because it totally subverts what we believe about women and about mothers that, mm. that this, that women are, like you said, this, this kind of dichotomy that we believe about women, either they're perfect, nurturing, wonderful mothers, or they're like horrible, psychotic, you know, killers, you know? Right. They can't, there's, it's not, we can't be complicated enough to be both at the same time, mm-hmm. which apparently Elizabeth Brown Rigg was both. Right. You know, like because her her family loved her, right? Yes, mm-hmm. and she didn't abuse her sons, right? So, and they loved her, and but there was also that sort of dysfunctional thing where they were they kind of got in on it too, and that's why I say uh, there's this fine line between like sexual desire and violence, that you know it's it's one of the main things that they did was keep them naked a lot, mm-hmm. and so they would have these naked girls around the house all the time. You know, this is this sort of thing. That's why the story was so racy to people at the time. Yeah. And that's probably how, you know, she got her teenage boys to kind of start liking this. Mm-hmm. Is There's naked girls and you can hit them and you see your mother enjoying that and you think, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. Like, this is good. You know, it's a very, a very weird thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Murder. Murder number two. In the books. Thanks for listening to our uh, second episode in our crime series. We hope that you're enjoying this cross between true crime and history. Yes. And you can get our transcripts and further reading on the Elizabeth Brown Rigg case at digpodcast.org. Um, in case you missed some details and you want to go back and look over the words that we wrote, that, was, that Marissa wrote, um, you should follow us, if you haven't already, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at dig underscore history. You should leave us a rating or review on iTunes or send us an email or a tweet or whatever. Um, and we'll, you know, share those here as they come in because we love hearing from you. Um, it touches our... It touches our sneezy hearts. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes. Thanks for listening. And for all the women historians here at Dig, I'm Averill. And I'm Marissa. We'll see you next time. The mound was... Oh, the mound was round. I thought I had a 10-inch hair growing out of my boob. Thanks. I'm glad it wasn't. Ew. She, she loves it. She just loves my coffee. She's that one over there? Yeah, she was like, <sighs> so, so loud. No, it's, it, I have this cold I feel like I can't breathe, so I can be like, what? Did you come in with all that shit? She had to get that. I'm back, lady. I have so much stuff. Why do you have three bags? So you just didn't need the pin bag at all? Well, it has my makeup.
that tiny little container. Fuck off. <laughs> this is my life. Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh. You know what? When you need something, guess who has it? <laughs> you have it. Who has it?